In this lecture, we're, we're really going to hit upon four topics. The first of those is the rationale for economic regulation. So, so what are some of the basic reasons why economic, ration, or economic regulation exists? Two, a little bit about the history of economic regulation. So I'm looking at, I've got them listed here. <laughs> Third, the types of economic regulatories. <clears throat> so the different sort of structures that, that regulatory agencies can take. A and then uh, fourth, we'll introduce uh, a couple examples of uh, economic theories associated with regulation and, and, and particularly a couple models, right? It's kind of give you an idea about how economists think, conceptualize, and logically arrange their arguments. Okay. So let's just, you know, let's go, right? In a free society, right, which you know, certainly the United States would consider ourselves a free society, when we say that a free society, well, well, what do we really mean? Well, we mean that the principles, the culture, the mores, and the legal structure of the society are set up in a way to really allow individuals to do as they would, right? So they're liberal societies. You know, when we interact together as a society, of course, our free actions can impinge upon the, the freedoms of others. And so this is why a free society has to, to some, to some extent, limit the liberties of the individual. And so philosophically, you know, sort of this is the essence of, of where we're coming from uh, with regulation. You know, minimum wage example here. Uh, and then also we should understand that, that when we do regulate, right, that, that outcomes that we experience in the market are not just a function of market forces, but also of social fo social forces, which you know, sort of, to be honest, most most if not all markets all already are. To sort of think about this from a theoretical point, which is, is a class in in economics, right? So, what does sort of economic theory say about why we regulate? What is sort of the logical arguments for regulation? The most straightforward argument uh, that that that's sort of easy to see is the case of a natural monopoly. Now, when economists say a natural monopoly, there's, there's a meaning there, right? And what that meaning is, is, an, is a natural monopoly is a firm that can produce all the demand in that market and still not be operating at what, what we call its minimum efficient scale. That is to say, it can supply all the demand in an industry and if the market got bigger, it could actually continue to lower the costs. As a consequence, if there were multiple firms, costs would even be higher. Okay, so now that, that's sort of abstract. C give me an example, Camp. Okay, well, let's think of a small seaside city. Almost certainly, so seaports are expensive to produce, right? And almost certainly, the cost structure is going to be such that even one seaport uh, isn't isn't going to be able to operate at its maximum efficient scale. Okay. Um, if the seaport could be bigger or serve a, a bigger clientele, it would almost certainly operate at lower costs. Conversely, if there were two seaports, <laughs> it would be the situation would be even worse. Other examples might be like power distribution, right? So we have one set of power lines out there. If you could get a larger market. Uh, you would could likely reduce the costs per household to provide power. Having multiple power companies is almost certain to raise the cost. Okay, these are a couple examples of natural monopolies. Of course, technology can change, and this can turn what was a natural monopoly it can make it no longer the case as natural monopoly. So I'm, go back to our small city with its single port. If the city continues to grow. Right, it's it's highly likely that at some point a second port may become economically feasible, right? And then it's no longer a natural monopoly, okay? Um, and so natural monopolies can come into existence and they can disappear from existence based upon changing technological okay. conditions. <clears throat> now over here to the on the other side of the screen, we see sort of a graphical representation of this idea of natural monopoly. On the vertical axis, we have prices, right, or costs. And then Q is on the horizontal axis is output. LRAC is long run average cost. 
LRMC is long run marginal cost. So what we see illustrated in this representation over here on the other side <clears throat> is the idea that costs on average, right, are decreasing as output increases. And indeed, for the entire range of this function, more output equals lower costs. Okay. This is a natural monopoly situation. So if we observe this in the marketplace, or oh, if the industry got, or if, excuse me, if the market got bigger, this single firm supplying could lower, continue to lower costs. In other words, they can make things cheaper and cheaper and cheaper for consumers. Okay. That's a natural monopoly. Okay. And you know these show up in places where you have often where you have smaller or newish markets uh, that are limited, uh, and you know it really isn't even big enough for one firm to operate efficiently. The firms also tend to be of a technological structure that requires a certain amount of size, like a, like a port or massive infrastructure of some sort. Okay, here now we see the idea of a temporary natural monopoly. So for all output up to Q star, right, costs are declining. But beyond Q star now, costs are bottomed out. And so as Q continues to grow, quantity that is, quantity of output, the average cost remains the same. Okay? As we move beyond Q2, as the market size moves beyond Q star, excuse me, it may become possible for a second firm to operate in this market and then for those two firms to effectively compete with each other to ensure uh, positive outcome market outcomes um, there are some conditions on that which is why I said may a little while ago which we'll consider in some depth in a future lecture okay so now beyond sort of the the obvious right it's why why do we need to regulate it? because there's it, we can't have a competitive market right natural monopoly yeah. There are other reasons for regulation. Here we see a few of them. We have bad information. This is an example I gave in a previous lecture. You know, and here, you know, what makes for a safe heart surgery? You know, do I if I have God forbid, right? If I have if I have some heart problems now, you know, I mean, am I gonna shop around? Am I gonna, you know, get price quotes from different doctors? No, obviously not. Uh, so oftentimes in, in modern markets, you know, we have with, with advanced technology, we have relatively poor information uh, or ability to choose that, that puts us in a situation where we essentially need that information provided to us. There is, of course, also social reasons for this. And we talked a little bit about this in the last lecture, but you know, economic regulation is often, in fact, more often than not, developed for non-economic reasons. You know, these, these have to do with a variety of things, sort of maintaining social order, uh, perceptions of right and wrong, you know, what's moral and immoral, maintaining certain minimum standards, right, because of course my, you know, market choices impact other people besides me, and their market choices may impact me, and there are certain minimums that I want to ensure that as a society we all adhere to. Now, there are um, several sort of channels we can take to regulate markets. One of those is we can control the price. So we can say the price will not be greater than or will not be less than. Uh, we can, of course, also control the quantity of output, right? So we can limit the amount of this that is provided to the market, or we can create a minimum. You know, a certain amount will be provided to the market. Okay? Uh, and of course, these are not mutually exclusive, right? We can, we can do both of these at the same time. Thirdly, we can also control the entry and exit to the industry. We can determine you know, sort of which firms will be allowed to operate in this market. So, for example, in uh, medicinal markets, the markets for medicine, you know, we put strict controls upon who can produce medicines. Um, we, you know, I mentioned like ports or airports. These they're extremely strict controls upon who can provide port services. You know, whether it be an airport or a seaport or even a land terminal. We can also put controls on whether you can exit an industry. Now, that may seem strange to you, but, but in fact, that's something we, we've done historically and we do pretty regularly. In smaller cities, right, we may, we may make a requirement that if the firm is going to operate in the big city where it's very profitable, they also have to operate in the smaller city. And so we don't allow firms to exit some markets that might be 
unprofitable uh, for other reasons. And we'll talk about that in depth, about why you would do that and, and how you would do that. Then, then besides those sort of four basics, right, of price, quantity, entry, exit, right, there's also a variety of other sort of more subtle controls that can be put on uh, business or, or industry or a series of industries. Okay, so a little bit about the history of economic regulation. Now, as I said in the last video, um, you know, as, as long as there have been markets of any size, there, there's been regulation in any place. Society will always put controls upon market activities. They always have, they always will. Okay, um, it's a whole nother course, you know, why, why that is. Take Take my see my history of thought series of lectures, history of economic thought lectures. But when we point to sort of the widespread regulation of the modern United States, uh, there's a few things that we should take a look at. And then the second thing that we want to be getting out of this section on the history is the understanding that regulation builds upon historical precedent. So regulation and, and so as, as economists right we need to know the historical precedent for whatever area we're regulating we need to understand the laws associated with the regulations when, when I was a regulator uh, literally so where my monitor is now right in front of me here right right next to that on my desk were all the regulations and all the laws that were associated with the work I was supposed to be doing on my desk, not on a bookshelf, on my desk. Um, and so that any, you know, at any time, anything I was doing, I could, you know, instantly consult um, the relevant regs, okay, and the relevant historical legal structure that I was working upon. Um, so that's really what we should get out of this section. So here we have Munn versus Illinois in 1877. This is sort of important legal precedent. Okay. In this this case, okay, provided the foundation for the regulation used to prevent monopolistic exploitation of consumers. So this was sort of the beginning of legal recognition that in the United States that firms in certain markets could extract value from the consumers, or they could uh, effectively use their market position to leverage themselves in their favor against consumers. Other important pieces of legislation, and these occur largely through the latter part of the 19th century and early parts of the 20th century in the United States because sort of, sort of the arc of U.S. historical economic development. Interstate Commerce Act, 1877, and which created the ICC, the Interstate Commerce Commission. Okay. And uh, what, what the United States had seen in the mid to late years of the 19th century was all sorts of crazy competition uh, in the railroad, across the railroad, firms engage in, in shipping via rail. And this had led to a lot of sort of both agricultural uh, goods and services not getting to market, uh, as well as a number of manufactured goods not being able to get to market. In other words, the disruptive competition, if you allow me to use that phrase, um, of of the railroad industry was disrupting g industry in general in the United States. And so there was a, a widespread recognition that for the good of all these other industries, in other words, for the good of the liberty of all these people running these other businesses as they would and consumers to do as they would, there needed to be some controls placed upon the movement of these goods and services and the types of activities that those um, firms in that industry, transportation, rail transportation, uh, could partake in. Now, in the more modern era, so since the late mid to late 1970s, the United States has really been in a deregulatory phase. That is, many of these industries have been highly deregulated. Now, banking, uh, interestingly enough, in the last few years is, is moving back in the other direction. Once sort of the Congress, or as we'll see in some cases, the executive has, has decided that um, you know, we need a regulatory agency to make this stuff happen, to go figure out how we're going to do this thing the society wants. You know, the first task is to figure out what, what agency should do this work. Should it be existing agency that already exists, or should we create a new one? Um, and then where should that agency be housed? What, should, what kind of oversight should exist for that agency? Uh, basically, where is that 
where are the people that are going to be in charge of making sure that the thing happens where are they going to be housed um, and you know there should be of course some some logic one would hope to that then also we have to figure out you know what is the extent of the power of this regulatory agency uh, do you know do they have unlimited power of course not what are their limitations of their power what authority do they have what can they ask for right that that's an important thing that that doesn't probably doesn't get talked about enough like what kind of information can a regulatory agency ask for again you know in my experience I kept the regs right on my desk and I knew like so somebody would tell me and this happened more frequently than not frankly somebody would say to me like well we don't we don't have to provide that I grab my book there it is right there that's what you have to provide that's what the law says um, oh okay all right <laughs> um, and, and similarly, you better not be asking for things that you're not, not allowed to ask for because that'll get you in a whole different kind of trouble. Um, so sort of knowing what your, what your task is as a regulator, knowing what your job is, uh, knowing what, what the public has sort of told you to go fix, right? That, those are some of the most important things of being a regulator. You know, throughout this course, we're going to be talking a lot about sort of technical details and you know math equations and things like that but but honestly you know some of the most important thing is just knowing you know what what am i here to be doing what what problem am i here to be fixing and what you know what what latitude has society given me to fix those um so uh incredibly important incredibly important so maybe maybe more important than anything else so <clears throat> types of regulatories okay so regulations don't have to be run through a regulatory agency but more often than not they are Okay. you can directly require right and uh, this class is mostly based around sort of the American history of regulation but like the European history of regulation is actually quite different uh, in 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 Europe sort of this first this first item is, is much more common where the law will actually say you know you have to do this you have to do this you have to do this for example here like you know all cars have to have seat belts the law actually says that all cars have to have seat belts in the United States that kind of way of regulating isn't that common and we'll be talking about why that is actually the economics has a lot to say about why maybe you, you wouldn't do it that way right in the US generally speaking we don't generally we will make a law saying something like you know the air will be clean or the air will be clean enough that people's health will not be impaired <laughs> okay and then you know, the regulators have to figure out okay what does that mean and how do we do that okay and that gets you into one of these other two categories so independent regulatory commissions okay uh, talk a little bit more about this but how that works is what you do is you get sort of you appoint people uh, from different interest groups across the areas impacted by the regulation to sort of get together figure out what's being done to mitigate the problem figuring out what can be done uh, and then implementing uh, that okay uh, and this will also include uh, supporting experts from a variety of fields so for example um, I'm trying to think of the specific makeup of any of these but uh, let's say you had a commission regulatory commission on say worker safety you, know, you might have a membership member from industry you might have a member from labor like a labor leader uh, and you might have somebody from the government and then you might have somebody from like the medical profession on that commission okay uh, and then they sort of figure out what what can be done and then those people will be informed by a host of professionals both within government and without so there you'd find the economists and things like this that that are going to provide information to those individuals Okay. Finally, then, and this is one we sort of n notice the most, maybe, or maybe we think about the most when we when we, when we think about regulatory agencies or executive branch uh, agencies. So it's like the EPA, OCC, uh, and they develop rules uh, to fulfill these sort of broader legislative mandates. So that's sort of the process that I've been describing, my sort of my default, because that's uh, in the U.S. That's sort of the way most regulation occurs. Um, in the modern era okay now uh, I'm not going to talk extensively about the rulemaking process because I did that in the second lecture so if you're interested in the details of uh, what rules are and the process of how they're developed uh, see the second lecture in this series okay um, but but here we'll just say short quickly 
as I mentioned, you know, most times what will happen is the legislative branch or the, the legal, the lawmaking component of government will make a rule saying, or excuse me, make, make a law saying something like, you know, there will be clean air or, you know, nobody's health will be impaired by polluted air. And then they say, okay, you regulatory agency, you know, maybe the environmental protection agency, you, you go figure out how to make sure that happens. And then that regulatory agency comes up with a set of rules like, oh, well, we've determined that if, you know, there's more than this number of parts per million of carbon monoxide in the air, then people's health are damaged. And so what we're going to do is we're going to monitor air quality and any firm that is found to be emitting, you know, more than this much carbon monoxide will be fined or whatever. Okay, those are referred to as the rules issued by the regulatory agency to fulfill the mandate given by the legal requirement. Okay, let's talk a little bit now about economic theories of regulation. Now, before we get into this, you know, when I was taught all this stuff, you know, back years and years ago now, sort of we would go through these models, we would find the tangencies, and then it was, it was almost like a game we played, you know, amongst ourselves and our faculty, like... Oh, can we find the tangency point and resolve the maximization problem and things like this? And that's good, right? You should be able to do that um, as as professional economists. Um, but but the more important thing to get out of these models is to understand is that these are they do two things, right? First, first they're logical conceptions of ideas, right? So that we can sort of see our ideas presented as mathematical equations or as models that are uh, clear, right? That anybody can look at it and be like, oh, that's what it is, right? Now you're saying like, oh, these graphs aren't clear, right? T sorry, anybody who's trained can understand what's going on. There's no confusion. Whereas if I speak in English or some other language, confusion can arise in terms of meanings of words, but there can be no confusion over an equality sign or a greater than sign or a less than sign or you name it. Now, in the models we're going to develop here today, we're going to assume a couple things. One, the state has the power to co coerce. In other words, the state can make people do things or or not do things that would be uh, that they would otherwise do or not do. Okay, so the state can make people do things. Second of all, we're going to assume that that individuals are rational in the sense that we always say they are in economics, or I shouldn't say always, but textbooks always sort of say they are that is that they sort of maximize their own objectives okay what, whatever those are All right the first little model we'll, we'll talk about today is this Pelz, Peltzman Olson model um, and that that works on three ideas right so here's sort of the narrative form and then what we'll do in the next slide is I'll show you sort of the, the formalization first of all this model we say regulation generally results in a redistribution of wealth now we talked about that in the second lecture. It says we regulate, right? Somebody's going to be better off, and almost certainly somebody's going to be worse off. Okay. Second, we're going to assume that politicians like their jobs and they want to stay in office. Okay. Third, we're going to assume that interest groups compete with other interest groups. So you've got individuals that form into groups because they have similar interests. And then they advocate for those interests. This is this is uh, the Olson part. This is Manker Olson's Logic of Collective Action. It's a great book. I, I recommend it. You, sh you should read it. Um, Logic of Collective Action, Manker Olson. And uh, then finally, uh, the result is regulation will occur in monopolistic and competitive markets. Right. So this this model shows you why that um, regulation can sort of pop up all over the place based upon these above three assumptions. What is this? And I'm going to use the cursor here. Even I don't like to do that generally, but okay. So what is this? P are prices. Okay. So this is prices increasing. Pi is profitability. Okay. So the arc function here, right, is profits, which are a function of price for the firm. Okay. So this is the competitive price, and we know that in competitive markets, um, irregular profits are zero. Right. So this function starts out at zero where this is sort of the competitive rate of return. Uh, the function increases until it reaches a peak, which is P superscript M, or the monopoly price, where profits are maximized, which would be 
the monopolist where marginal cost equals marginal revenues. And then of course at all prices above that profit profit actually declines right until you reach the intercept of the monopolist demand curve where the price is now so high that, that nobody buys anything in this market. So profits are completely eliminated. Okay, so the monopolistic firm uh, faces this, uh, this, this function. And of course, uh, indeed, even semi-competitive firms face this type of profit function. And of course, wholly competitive firms, uh, you know, in the short run may experience basically the same type of relationship, but it would if we were to graph them side by side, it would you know be much smaller. Okay. S then is the level of political support <laughs> for for the activity for the regulation. Okay, and uh, of course everybody prefers sort of lower prices, right? And so we get this kind of sort of shape here. And what the uh, uh, Peltzman model tells us then, so when we sort of solve it all out, right, is it tells us that what we're going to end up with is a price that's something like this, right, that um, is somewhere between the competitive and the monopoly result, right, um, and so we're going to see regulation pop up. It really doesn't doesn't matter whether the the the, the firm is uh, competitive or or not on its on its head. Uh, what what it really depends upon is sort of the uh, positions of of interest groups versus the firms, right? Um, <laughs> so the you know the, the firm would like would like profits to be be higher, right? And various interest groups would like the prices to be lower, uh, and uh, so you you end up with this sort of result that's 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 optimal from from the model's perspective. Um, it's an optimized optimization across various groups of individuals and the firms involved, uh, but it's not optimal in a, um, you know, in the sense that we would say normally the competitive market outcomes are optimal. So of course, prices are higher, and of course, um, output's going to be lower. All all things being equal, than it would be in a competitive market. So again, it's a way of sort of formalizing this idea of sort of putting the logic together. And, and as economists, you should sort of be in a position where all these sort of models become kind of back pocket for you. And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, like let's say you're asked a question, like, oh, like, well, well, should we regulate this market? Instantly, in you know, your brain should be able to recall this model and be like, oh, well, here's what's going on with this firm and these interest groups. In other words, you should you should be sort of able to apply the rationale to this mod of this model instantaneously to a real world situation. Just like a musician, you know, one musician may say to another, like, okay, what key are we going to play in? Okay, we're going to play in the key of G. Okay, they know, right? They both know, okay, G, it's got an F sharp, right? And all the other notes are natural. If you're not a musician, um, okay, let me think of another example. Um, you know, if if we, you know, if some if a group of friends says, "When are we getting together?" and they're like, 8 p.m." Everybody knows when 8 p.m. is, right? Okay, so so as an economist, this is sort of the tools of your trade, right? You should understand these these models and be able to apply them sort of instantaneously, but also recognize that this is just one of a host of sort of ways of thinking about regulation, right? And what this way tells us at the end of the day is that. You know, sort of the interaction of politicians, firms, and interest groups matters, and it's going to impact, it's likely to impact market outcomes in this type of way. Okay, okay let's play this game a second time. Becker model, famous economist Gary Becker, um, his model, regulation produces a transfer of wealth. Okay, so same. Becker model, politicians are simply a conduit for interest groups. In other words, in Becker's model now, you know, politicians sort of don't get to choose <laughs> the level of regulation like in the Peltzman model. No, they just do what interest groups tell them. Okay, and you may say, well, they've got isn't there multiple interest groups? Yes, that's the point, right? Okay, so who, whatever interest group sort of leans on them the most or is leverages them the most sort of gets what they want. Okay, and so the result from this is that what you end up happening or what the Becker model tells you is that interest groups are going to are going to spend way more than than maybe would be optimal to try to leverage politicians in other words 
the Becker model says you're going to get a lot of money in politics. <laughs> I know, shocking, right? All right, let's 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 take a look at the formalization. Here we go. Ready? Okay, so what are each of these? Okay, R1 is the transfer of wealth. So, so like, remember I said everybody's going to sort of, with regulation, people might benefit and lose, benefit and others cost. Okay, so R1 is the benefit received to interest group one. Okay, R2 is the benefit received to interest group two. Now, each of these functions is a function of itself is a function of two things. Okay, first, how much pressure do they exert on politicians? Okay, so <clears throat> this is as more pressure is exerted. Okay, more pressure exerted by R1, more pressure exerted by R2. The second thing is how much pressure is exerted by the other interest group. Okay, so this function here for R1 is dependent upon how much pressure they, our group R1, exerts on politicians as well as how much R2 exerts. Now, of course, the more R2 exerts, the less effective R1's pressure campaign is. And conversely, for R2, the more R1 pressures, legislators, the less effective any given amount of pressure is for the other group, R2. And so that gives you these relationships where the essentially by our assumptions, the slope of this has to be less than the slope of this. And as a consequence, and the intercepts have to be accordingly, okay, positive, positive, or I should say negative, positive, y. And as a consequence of that, geometrically, we know that these are going to cross somewhere. Okay, and what is that when it when it crosses, right? Okay, well, it's just an equilibrium point where neither group has an incentive to change their pressure campaign, right? And long story short, you know, what you get out of this idea is the idea that, as I mentioned a moment ago, these interest groups are going to sort of compete against each other to get what they want. Uh, and... Uh, they're likely to end up spending far more on that pressure than they would have needed to spend if they could have gotten together and sort of split up the politician's influence. Uh, so what it is really is, is a sort of a prisoner's dilemma game applied to uh, the peddling of political influence <laughs> or the leveraging of political influence. So... Uh, what does this tell you as a regulator? Well, as a regulator, you should have this in your back pocket too. And as your back pocket, what is this telling you? So when somebody comes to you and be like, "Oh, well, you know, we want to, we're thinking about putting this regulation on this industry," right away as a regulator, you should be thinking, "Who are the interest groups? Who's going to try to to lobby on this? What are they going to What are they going to you know want?" Because our Becker model tells us that it's almost certain that a lot of pressure is going to come your way. So you should anticipate it as a regulator, right? That's what you want to, that's what these models should teach you, right? You should know that without, without having to go back to the textbook and look at it. You should know, right? You should know instinctively as a regulator, like, oh, okay, regulation, who are the affected parties? Who are the interest groups? Who's going to come, come and, you know, try to, leverage this politician, leverage leadership, and you know what's that going to look like? Now, to conclude, all theories of economic regulation, so we just went through two, right? All these are imperfect, right? As an applied regulator, we want to sort of have as many of these theories sort of in our back pocket as possible and know when they're applicable, when they're not, and then to apply that knowledge to our design and implementation of the regulation. All right, well, that's plenty enough for now. Um, I hope you've uh, enjoyed this third lecture, uh, which is some you know basics of construction of economic regulation, a little history here. Um, we'll be back next time when we'll be you know getting deeper into uh, really the meat and potatoes or the, the core substance of, of regulatory design. Um, working through more models um, more deeply um, and, and thinking more seriously about, about how sort of we get the sort of economic outcomes that society is asking us to get. Okay, thanks everybody. See you again next time. Bye.